So for many of you, Giffords is a lovely nostalgic memory. It was founded in 1938. Giffords had multiple stores throughout the DC area. And those stores were large sit down parlors with table service. <clears throat> the parlor at Silver Spring could seat 150 people. Uh, and that was the main headquarters, the Silver Spring store. Wait waitresses in uniform brought you oversized sundaes and desserts and porcelain and stainless steel containers. And all of this seemed very magical. Uh, though behind the scenes, it was a nightmare, but sitting there in the parlor, I, I, I know this kind of lure that the nostalgia had. There's nothing quite like it today. There probably never will be again. If we can do the next slide. So in 1985, the company went bankrupt and my father vanished without a trace, taking with him millions of dollars. He cleaned out the payroll, the health insurance fund and the pension. Along with other members of my family, he orchestrated what I think is one of the greatest heists in the DC area. At the time, the sheriff speculated that he left with nearly $10 million in cash. So understanding the history of Gifford's ice cream from the founding to the demise to the modern day reboot attempts was one of the harder tasks when I wrote We All Scream. Everything about the history of the company and my family was hidden from me. We didn't have family stories, uh, none that were true. It was forbidden to speak of my grandparents. I didn't know where we came from. I didn't know our family tree at all. I didn't even know when or how my grandparents died until 2014. And it turns out that they had died in 76 and 81. I found out then that my grandmother, so reviled by my family, had been buried in an unmarked grave in Gate of Heaven at Aspen Hill, Maryland. That grave is still unmarked today. I didn't know anything about the founding of the company or about my extended family. My grandfather had a brother and generations of his family lived just a few miles away, but they hadn't had contact with my family since 1949. So it took me years of research to piece together this history and the history of my own people. And I still don't really understand why my family did the things they did. If we could do the next slide. Gifford's Ice Cream officially opened its doors May 22nd, 1938. It was incorporated uh, in September of that same year. The first store was in Georgia Avenue. Uh, in Sil Silver Spring, uh, and that building is still there. All the buildings, except for the Bethesda building, are still standing. In the other photos here, we have the Bethesda store on the left, and that's the Arlington store there. There was a store at Bailey's Crossroads, and in later years, there would be a store in Vienna and one in Gaithersburg. The Gaithersburg store acted as a model for my father's franchise scheme. Uh, he would uh, dupe investors out of uh, about $300,000 each, I think, and there were dozens of them, uh, handshake deals to open up their own Giffords franchise, and he took that money when he vanished. The Gaithersburg store never sold a single scoop of ice cream. Uh, next slide, please. This is my grandfather, John Nash Gifford. He opened Giffords along with several partners, including my grandmother, Mary Frances. The store in Silver Spring was a massive success, uh, so much so that they opened the sec second store just about a year later in Bethesda. And then World War II came. My grandfather's partners went off to fight in Europe and the Pacific, and not all of them came back. Those who did were bought out and they faded out of the history. By 1948, the only surviving partners were my grandfather, my grandmother, and a man equally as mysterious and troubled as my family, George Milroy. And I could probably just write a book about Milroy too. He had a crazy life and a crazy ending. Giffords was an instant success from day one. Uh, and I always get nervous throwing out these numbers, <laughs> but uh, according to my research, Montgomery County, uh, where, the, where the first two stores were, had under 100,000 residents at the time. So the 1940 census said 80,000 residents. By 1946, 
Giffords was producing and selling 90,000 gallons of ice cream every week. Uh, so that's close to 5 million gallons a year, if my math is correct, uh, just out of two locations. And that's just the ice cream. I have no idea what the candy sales were doing at that time. So in 1938, the total cost for opening Giffords was about $20,000. According to Google, that's about $400,000 in today's money. Uh, that included the entirety of a 99-year lease on the Silver Spring store. By 1946, on the ice cream alone, Giffords was making over $400,000 a week in 1946 money. So in today's money, again, according to Google, and I have a hard time believing this, but Google says if we convert that to today's spending power, that's almost $6 million a week that they're making in 1946, which is almost too much to imagine. Uh, my grandfather became a major mover and shaker in Montgomery County. So he was a founding member and on the board of the Citizens Building and Loan Bank of Silver Spring, which pretty much built Silver Spring in the post-war boom. In the 1950s, my grandfather and George Milroy opened two more stores in Arlington and ba Bailey's Crossroads, and those profits just continued to go up. If we can do the next card. So this isn't a self-made man story. Uh, John Gifford came from old money. Uh, he came from a very wealthy family. His parents are right here. This is Carl and Stella Gifford, and that's John in between them. Uh, Carl died young. And it was just a few years after this picture was taken, but the money belonged to Stella. Uh, Stella Nash was one of many children of uh, William Nash, and he was from Indiana. And in the Civil War, he was poor. Uh, when the war started, he was a young boy. He vo volunteered and he went off as a drummer boy uh, fighting for the Union. And when he came back after the war, very suspiciously, he had tons of money. He bought several thousand acres of land and he became something of a potentate in Tipton. Indiana. Uh, there's historical accounts of him that pretty much, pretty much just show a man who owned this town and you did as he said. So I think he had, it's in the book and I've now forgotten, I should have written it down, something like 13 kids. So he had a ton of kids and each of them got a huge inheritance. It, it was in the neighborhood of about a million dollars in today's money. So that's where the money for the founding of Giffords came from. It came from Stella. Uh, when John was 18 years old, as World War I was raging in Europe, he bought himself an airplane, which is outlandish at, at the time. And by the time the U.S. entered into World War I, as I said, he had more flying hours than the Red Baron. He had allegedly, and it, this was on the records that I found from, from the Army, uh, had flown across the country, which predates uh, the record, I think. So it's strange that he doesn't show up on any of the lists as a pilot. Uh, this doesn't seem to be mentioned again in any other record. So it's bizarre. And the family's bizarre going all the way back, not just the mysterious Civil War money, but Carl's death, very young, he died in his 30s. Stella, at, uh, when John was six years old, Stella Nash would vanish, and she wouldn't resurface until 1929, dead in a morgue in Denver. And why, how? Not clear at all. So there are rumors that John, my grandfather, was always crazy. People talk about unpredictable moods. They talk about threats of violence. Uh, I in interviewed a neighbor who, as a young boy, kicked a ball into the yard of our family house. And John punctured the ball with the knife, attacked the boy, attacked his mother. Over 50 years later, I sat with him in a pub uh, just doing research for the book. And he's now, he's now this high-powered lawyer guy downtown, and he burst into tears when he told me this story. Uh, another person told me that John would conduct interviews with local journalists by first putting a gun on the table and saying, I hope this interview is going to go well. 
But for as many sad stories like that and scary stories like that, there's also stories praising my grandparents. Uh, there's people who think they were pillars of the community and generous to a fault. Uh, I've talked to uh, college friends and the children of co college friends who, who went to school with my grandfather. And whenever they came to town, my grandfather would shut down the Silver Spring store and lay out this lavish feast for them, you know, China, Crystal, just what, you know, this insanely generous feast. After World War II, John spent hours every single day volunteering with wounded veterans at Walter Reed and handing out free ice cream. So yeah, for every story of madness, there's almost a story of no normalcy uh, to, to counterbalance it. And the more I researched the book, the more I found this about everybody in it. They would do these cruel, terrible things, and then they would do these insanely generous and kind things. But by the 1970s, something had definitely gone wrong with my grandparents, John and Mary. They became erratic both at the store and at home. John died in 1976, and the rumors were that he went mad, that he saw tiny creatures who were telling him to do crazy things. There's, there's a rumor that he marched down Georgia Avenue naked with a shotgun. Mary Frances was struck down by a stroke in 1977, and she never walked or talked again. And she would linger on in a near vegetative state until 1981. And after the stroke, when they cleaned out the uh, house in Kensington, they found that John and Mary had been storing ice cream all throughout the house. It had, you know, not in the freezer, just in the cabinets under the table filling the hallways, just melting, just massive mounds of ice cream. Crazy. Mm. So the last surviving partner, George Milroy, ran Giffords from 1977 to 1981. And my dad, who would have been in his 40s then, had very little to do with the company. He worked at the stores. He scooped ice cream. He pretended to be a manager, but he had no official position and no paycheck. In fact, he would never take a paycheck even when he did become the head of the company. Uh, this is a man who lived off the grid for almost his entire life. The only time he drew pay was when he was with the army in 66. And beyond that, he hadn't paid taxes. He never had a credit card. He never had a mortgage or a lease. The public record on him wouldn't fill an envelope. In the mid-70s, everyone was fighting over Giffords. My mom's parents were trying to take control. Uh, George Milroy had control, but dad had decided that he was going to take control. And also, I think he decided then he wanted to destroy the company. And I think mom was working along with him. By 1980, my father had put plans in motion. He had begun draining the bank accounts, the payroll, the pension, the health insurance, and the family trust. And seemingly all of this happened with the cooperation of George Milroy. In 1985, my father vanished with the millions and Giffords went bankrupt, the stores closed, and my father's trail went cold for 15 years. We can do the next slide. As I pieced together the demise of Giffords, the story seemed pretty clear. I spoke to neighbors, childhood friends, the children of my family's household employees. According to many accounts, my father was ruthlessly abused. All of this happened in an era where one does not talk about the nature of abuse or abuse at all. So how bad it was remains unclear, but all the signs were there, even in adulthood. My father was a strange man. He was nervous, he was timid was conniving, always a back channeler. He used to like to squeeze into places. He would stand in the boiler room at my childhood home in Kensington, wedged between the heating oil tank and the brick wall and just drink and chain smoke. At his office in Silver Spring, he would push himself into a little coat closet that was just jammed with junk from my grandfather and past people, you know, but the door wouldn't even close, but he would jam in there and again, smoke and drink. And I guess he was hiding or just didn't want to be noticed or I don't know. 
On the right of the screen here is John and Mary Francis. They're in the backyard uh, of our home in Kensington. And on the left is what is known as Indian Rock. Uh, it stood on the spot where the Beltway now passes over Jones Bridge Road in Kensington. It was blown up to make room for the Beltway. Dad used to tell me about his long treks in Rock Creek Park. He would play on Indian Rock, and sometimes, he said, he would spend days camping out in the woods. And he would always encourage me to do the same, to get out of the house, to try and hide. I never did. Maybe I should have. That house, for me, is a house of horrors. It still haunts my dreams today. I think it haunted his dreams every day of his life. If we can do the next slide. And there it is. 9615 West Bexhill Drive. If you go on Zillow, it's beautiful. They've uh, completely redone it. But I can't even drive through Kensington without feeling this deep fear. Just looking at this slide now <laughs> makes me kind of, makes my heart shudder a bit. The things that went on behind those windows are unspeakable. Uh, if we can do the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> uh, on the uh, top right there, we uh, have my dad. That's Robert Gifford, and that's me. And on the bottom is my mom, Barbara Gifford. Uh, even after dad vanished, the cycle of abuse in my family continued. My mother loved to play pranks. Uh, she was quick to anger. Her rage was irrational. It was often violent. And she was brilliant. Uh, it was a dangerous trait for someone who wants to torture you. She could break people down at a glance, learn their weaknesses, and then just poke and prod until you went insane. Uh, we All Scream is as much an investigation of, of her and her family as it is my dad's side of the family. Her pranks were impossibly elaborate. Uh, the book opens up with a scene on Deep Creek Lake uh, where mom tried to convince me, I was then six years old, that we were going to get sucked under the dam that forms the lake and die. And the prank involved my father and play acting that the motorboat had run out of gas and letting it get as close to the dam as possible. I'm still afraid of water and boats today. <laughs> That's my earliest memory and only the tip of the iceberg when it came to her pranks. She had a troubled childhood. Uh, she ran away several times. She got into drugs. She dropped out of high school and she was constantly battling with her father. In all my research, I found out that no one really knew mom. Uh, almost every story about her is different. She had a thousand faces, and even friends and lovers didn't get the whole truth. My family still remembers her with fear and resentment. She committed suicide in 99. I hadn't mm -hmm. spoken to her since 92. She was 47 years old. I look at these pictures and others like them, and I see these smiles. That's mom down there about a year before she met dad. And I look at them and even with all of these stories and knowing what happened and everything I've heard that's in the book and that's not in the book, I still wonder what really happened to them. What made them do these things that they did? And could we, could someone out there have helped them, done something for them? The more I researched the book, the more I felt that these weren't monsters or criminals. These were people who needed help and never got it. If we can do the next card. Gifford shut down in 1985, and today everyone is dead. My parents, my grandparents on both sides, all of the original partners. I wanted to never hear about Gifford's ice cream again. I wanted to heal and grow beyond what had happened to us. But in 1989, the company was revived by Dolly Hunt. She bought the name and the trademark for $1,500. And since then, there have been eight attempts to reboot Gifford's in DC. And some did very well. And some made my father's criminal actions look innocent. Uh, 
Giffords is currently owned by a company in Maine who bought the trademark and the name, but they are completely unrelated. It is not Giffords ice cream. But people seem to like to cash in on the nostalgia. And so the dark shadow of my family just doesn't die. The rebooters make a ton of money and all of them are at best unethical. If we could do the next card. This is the menu from the 1950s. Everyone praises my family. People go on and on about the Alpine split, the big top, the Swiss chocolate sauce. And Giffords has moved into legend. Uh, for some people, uh, it literally is a legend. There are people who seriously claim that John Gifford sourced his inventory from these near magical places. There are lots of folks who honestly believe that the chocolate was sourced from a secret chocolate grove in Austria. I hear from these people all the time, it's nuts. Uh, you know, this is stuff that seems outlandish to Willy Wonka. There are people who truly believe that the pistachios for the pistachio ice cream came from a remote Moroccan village that you have to get to Indiana Jones style. People will defend the legacy of Gifford, sometimes to the point of violence. When I used to do uh, live events for this book, I was attacked in a parking lot after one at Politics and Prose. I was thrown against a car and the person told me that Giffords is their story. It's not mine, it belongs to them. And how dare I ruin their childhood? So I love nostalgia and I hate to mess with it or refute it, but I feel like we need to be responsible about it. And my family didn't just destroy my life, they destroyed many other lives. And for every person who has called my grandparents heroes, I have spoken to many who still harbor an intense hatred for them. I think the nostalgia is about the place. I think it's about the store. I think it's about the candy counter and that's fine. I do love the old pictures and the old parlors were cool. As I said at the beginning, there's nothing like them now and there won't ever be anything like that. You'll never see a 150 seat ice cream parlor again. And then there's the waitresses in uniform gliding towards your table with, uh, you know, your sh sugary snacks. And in some cases, that waitress may have been a young Katie Cor Corrick at the Arlington store or Goldie Hawn, who worked at the Silver Springs store, standing in front of you in line to get, a, to get a seat or to get a cone may have been Mamie Eisenhower, who went to the Bethesda store weekly, or J. Edgar Hoover, who went several times a week to the Silver Springs store. Uh, Jackie O would have my grandfather make ice cream colored to match her gowns at White House events. But the ice cream in the end wasn't really all that magical. It just happened that for a while, there wasn't any competition. One of the founding partners was John Tillotson, a man who holds a patent for measuring the level of air in ice cream. And without that technology, it's difficult to mass produce a standardized product. So for a very brief time, Giffords benefited from that new technology and wouldn't see any serious large scale competition till the 50s. Today, you can get better ice cream pretty much everywhere. And that's probably been true of Giffords since the 60s. Next card, please. These are the, some of the recipe cards. I have a lot of them. These are the alleged secret recipes that everyone talks about. And over the decades, people have paid thousands of dollars per recipe. Many believe that Giffords did something unique, but in reality, when you look at these cards and when you look at the mix, it's not original at all. In the 1950s and 60s, John Gifford started working with Shenandoah's Pride Dairy Farms, and they made the base mix, which they delivered to the Silver Spring store, and not just to Giffords, they delivered it to all of the other ice cream parlors starting in the 60s. So what, you had Swinson's, you had Baskin Robbins, you had Hot Shops, you name it. Ben and Jerry's, when they started out, used the same base mix. So the so-called secret recipes here have been sold and traded and fought over since 1986, but they're just directions for the flavorings that need to be added to the base mix. Swiss chocolate, nice and simple, sugar, cream, milk, it's ice cream, right? And you see one gallon of base mix there mentioned. So that's the only secret to it. 
On the bottom left is the country caramel recipe, which also makes mention of the mix. And there they call it ice cream milk. So I de deconstructed the base mix in We All Scream. And I also talked to a lot of the people who did make it before Shenandoah's Pride uh, and some folks from Shenandoah's Pride. So the technique to make it exactly as it was made back then is also in my book as well. Part of the goal of my book is to not only try to tell the truth about my family, but also to give you access to Giffords. All of the reboots are thriving on the idea that there's a secret and they're charging you a lot of money when you can do this yourself. Uh, I put these cards all over Facebook, the mix and the technique are in the book. And many of the book's readers have perfectly recreated the style, taste, and the mouthfeel of the ice cream. And pretty much all you need is your stovetop and an $80 Cuisinart ice cream maker. And you can make Gifford's ice cream, you can make the country caramels, you can make the sauces at home. If we can do the next card. Writing my memoir was difficult. I didn't wanna talk about this. I didn't wanna revisit them. I want no part of this story, but you can't escape your family. My choice I felt was to either be chased out of DC, get off social media, maybe never look at my mail or answer the phone, uh, or simply tell the story, tell the truth and talk about these people and talk about what they did. I chose the second option. I love living here, right? And my name is my name. My family is my family. It's a tarnished name, but I hope that someday things will change. The more I researched my family, the more I discovered, the more horrified I became. I started and gave up on the memoir a hundred times, probably. Uh, the original memoir was dry, journalistic, a simple accounting of what happened. But my writing mentor at the time was the late Alan Chus from NPR. And he told me that if I wanted to tell the story, I just had to tell it. I had to tell all of it, every detail, every dark secret. And I, I had to be the story is, is what he said. And so the book does start out with my story, growing up Gifford, uh, how I tried to escape. And then it sort of becomes something of a detective story. What happened to these people and why did they do what they did? And along the way, I found just broken, sad, strange people. I didn't find any monsters. I didn't find any criminals. I didn't find too many answers either. Uh, this was just untreated insanity, perhaps. But I was able to piece together some of the mystery, what dad was doing for 15 years, where he was, uh, what mom was thinking, what my grandparents were thinking. But still, when you're telling a story of these lonely, angry, broken people, there really are no answers. In the end, there really is no way to resolve their actions. If we can do the next screen. So the book is available everywhere books are sold. It's in the library, ebook, audiobook, and print. Uh, the publisher is the Santa Fe Writers Project. And uh, I guess we can move on to questions, if that's okay. Andrew, thank you for sharing your story. That's, it's just amazing. Um, we've lots of accolades for you here. Um, Helen says, thank you so much for your bravery in talking about the truth behind the myth of Giffords. I know you are helping others who have suffered abuse by sharing your story. I hope you have found some measure of peace through sharing your story. And thank you for your patience with people who tell you how wonderful Giffords was instead of recognizing the trauma you have endured. Thank you. <laughs> and then we see it says, uh, the past generation kept so many secrets un and unfortunately passed on so much heartache. Yes, they did. And then we do have a question. Was Giffords a franchise? It was not, no. My father started a franchise scheme towards the end. Uh, so Giffords was entirely owned by the family. Uh, what my dad then wanted to do was 
my grandfather's old plan from the 60s. So my grandfather wanted to become the Marriott of ice cream. And he wanted to open up franchises around the entire country. Uh, but then he went into what I think can best be described as a sharp decline into madness. And it sort of fell apart there. So my dad took the bones of that franchise plan. And he, along with my paternal grandfather and George Milroy, offered franchises, verbal agreements only, uh, I think I said like 300,000 each, and they got about 12, 13, 14 people to pay in on that. And then that's, uh, that's when dad skipped town and the, and the bankruptcy hit after they collected all that money. So it wasn't a franchise, but there was a franchise scheme. <laughs> right, and we have, let's see, Pat says she remembers the candy cases and where did the candies come from? Were they made or were they from a supplier or? They were made. Uh, so the candy was made at the Silver Spring store. Most of the second floor at Silver Spring was devoted to candy and sauces. Do you mind sharing a little bit about what happened with your dad and where he went in those missing 15 years, what you know? It ruins the book. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but okay. I will. I will. No, the book's been out for six years. So uh, he went to Atlanta and apparently everyone knew this. So he had kept in touch, not only with my mom, uh, but was giving her money. So we went on food stamps. Uh, and, and back then, mom would do these crazy things. Like she would have me take the food stamps in to buy a stick of gum. And they would give you cash back back then so that she could then buy beer and cigarettes with it. Right. So while we're doing that, it turns out that dad was sending her about 5000 or more a month. Uh, he was also in touch with my paternal grandparents. He was in touch with a local lawyer. Uh, who was handling the money and feeding him the money. He was completely off the grid down there in Atlanta for the 15 years, living entirely off of the money that he took, which I think just in adding up his life, because uh, at the same time, so in the last five years of his life, uh, he, he got emphysema and he was treating it himself. He was getting like illegal oxygen, uh, you know, sent to him. So he would do taxes for people who supplied oxygen to, um, uh, to hospitals and they would just give them, you know, oxygen that fell off the truck that I guess he was paying for. I don't know. I, he must have spent millions down there. But when I found him, uh, it was after mom killed herself and he sued me for what little of her estate there was. Um, she had vanished the year before to drive across the country and she gave away somewhere between 500,000 to 1.5 million to random people she encountered across the country. And she still had some money. It was about 30 or 40,000 when she died. And dad sued me for that. And that was for me, the first time I had heard from him since 85. So she killed herself in August of 99 and he sued me about six months later. And I had no idea he was even alive. Wow. So. We have a couple of other questions. It says, uh, who do you give credit to for your ability to keep your sanity into adulthood? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I. Ever since I was young, I've always kind of had the attitude, uh, you either deal with it or you die, you know, it's, uh, I, I've definitely had some dark moments there. I, there have been some members of my family who sort of tried to be there, but not really, you know, a lot of my family also tried to run away, uh, we were not a hugging family. We never said, I love you to each other. We, we just berated each other. So yeah, I, uh, I, I don't know how I've stayed sane. I'm not 100% sure I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, somebody says, many franchises are legal schemes where franchisees become indentured servants. <laughs> yes. um, and that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. There you go. Uh, do you think this book would be a good book for a sexual abuse second generation down survivor? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, that's there's certainly some triggers in there, but I don't get too deep into it. So it's, uh, I, I hope that there is, there is a story of resilience in there, but I, I definitely don't get into the darker details. So in terms of, in terms of triggers or sensitive material, that's not really in there. So yeah, it should be okay. What happened to the other partner, George Milroy? <laughs> Milroy, it's, I, again, like I said, I could just write a book about Milroy. So my grandfather's brother's family who lived in Cabin John, just like 10 miles away from where we lived. And I didn't know they existed at all uh, until 2005 when they called me out of the blue. And I still have trouble kind of connecting their family with ours. They're, all the records that John could destroy, he did destroy after some sort of feud in 1949. At the same time, so George Milroy, had worked with my grandfather at Franklin Ice Cream Company uh, up in Ohio and in New Jersey. And Mil Milroy was, uh, he, he worked the floor, I think, of the, of the plant in New Jersey. He left with my grandfather to start Giffords. And in 49, when my grandfather cut out all of his family, Milroy also cut out all of his family. So in trying to track down Milroy, I did find his family up in, they, they were in Pennsylvania, I think. They, they said, no one knows what happened. Milroy left in 49, never contacted them again, never had any words with them at all. Milroy died, uh, I wanna say, I want to say it was probably closer to 90 or so, uh, late 80s when he died. And he, he had a wife who died before him. When he died, he left all his money to the boy who mowed his lawn. So that was his only heir. Uh, he had a couple million. So. Wow. And there's so many weird things about Milroy along those lines. This guy, you know, he didn't have as troubled and insane a life, but oh, boy, he, uh, he's I interesting for sure. Oh. And Barbara wants to know what you wound up doing for a living. I run a small press. Uh, so we publish fiction and creative nonfiction. In fact, that's the Santa Fe Writers Project. So the book was originally published by Stillhouse Press out of George Mason. Uh, they dropped the book after five days uh, after it came out. So there was, there was some disagreements with the content of the book. I think they were scared of the Giffords people, who knows, or they were scared of me. Uh, <laughs> so after they dropped the book, that almost killed it. Uh, I had this small press that I started up in 98, so I've been doing it for a long time. So just to quickly get the book back out there, because we had a whole bunch of pre-orders, uh, I, I picked it up and just did it myself. So yeah, so I've been running the Santa Fe Writers Project since 98. Uh, we have quite a few books out. It's been doing well. Do you have do, any happy memories at all of Giffords? No. Not at all. <laughs> That's sad. <laughs> Let's see, we're kind of coming to an end here. Does anybody else have any more questions? Well, Andrew, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank um, you for having me. I think we all learned a lot. We all <laughs> question our happy memories of Giffords. <laughs> And I'm glad to answer any other questions or pointers on the recipes or making the ice cream. So you can track me down, you know. So just send through the contact form at Santa Fe and I'll be there. That's, I think that's how I got in touch with you. Mm. Thank you so much. And thanks 